We just, uh, so we spoke with the CEO of the Creative Commons uh, just last week and uh, actually addressed this problem. Uh, and so we looked at the history of open source and this has actually never happened. So these corporations don't take open source and compete. Uh, would be interesting to actually see examples. But uh, so there is a license, uh, the CC plus license, that allows you to basically uh, say a non-commercial uh, CC license. And then on top of that, you only allow commercial use for cooperatives. So that means basically that uh, you could do exactly what you want to do, that only other cooperatives can use it. So the, CC, the, the Creative Commons is happy to work with us and help with that. Okay, now that I thought we were announcing this at the end of the day, but uh, actually I also happen to be uh, on the board of Creative Commons Hong Kong, and we have lawyers okay, in Hong Kong to support the co-op uh, who want to use CC Plus license in Hong Kong okay, from uh, law schools here on, in this territory. Okay, without further ado, time is yours. Thanks, Jack. Um, thanks, everyone, for um, having me here. It's been an awesome, inspiring couple of days. I thought I'd do much like Felix and take you through some of our learnings as a way of kind of explaining what, what GetUp is and look at um, how to go about engaging members on a digital platform. Uh, a quick hat tip to the Business Council of Cooperatives and Mutuals, which is in Australia our peak body, um, which has been uh, incredibly instrumental in supporting the development of cooperatives and mutuals in Australia and also internationally. Um, a bit about me, uh, GetUp isn't financially sustainable. My day job is as an owner member of uh, Cooperative Bonds, which is a, a cooperatively owned consultancy for member-based organisations. And today I'm going to be talking uh, based on my background as founder or co-founder of GetUp, which I founded with my brother in 2013. And it's a community action platform. Uh, what that means is that uh, trade unions, cooperatives, schools can use it to self-organise their communities to do things like organise events, uh, recruit volunteers, undertake votes, uh, gather feedback. Um, it's not currently a cooperative. We're currently converting it to a cooperative. It's been a bit of a, a long journey by virtue of the fact we're actually converting it to an enterprise co-op, which kind of fits interestingly in the platform co-op space. Our enterprise members are likely to be um, the two of the largest Australians, of Australia's trade unions and the Global uh, Education Foundation. So that's currently underway. Um, our purpose is to help leaders within, an uh, within a community to, to organise. So we, and particularly volunteer leaders, given our, our, our communities, um, so we, our aim is to help those guys to get things done. Um, and the challenge that they face is that we're all saturated by information flow and, and uh, our attention as, as individuals has become a scarce commodity. So this is uh, not an engaged community. Um, what you've got there is someone sending a message out to all their members at the periphery. And um, this is the broadcast model that existed um, that, and that we still find in some of the organisations we talk to where an organiser thinks that they're engaging their members by sending a newsletter um, every fortnight um, via, via email. And to your members that looks like a lot like spam, basically. So this is what an engaged community looks like. Um, so this is a, da a data visualisation of a week's worth of messages being sent across a thousand person community, uh, school community. So what we've done is um, each red line represents one message going from person to person and in that outer rim we've, out we've put in all 900 parents into the eldest child's class. In that next circle inside of the those orange circles, so that next ring of orange circles, that is um, the teachers or the parent representatives for each class. In that next rim, you've got people who are running special groups within the school. So you've got the canteen manager or the kitchen garden volunteer manager or the parents association president. And at the centre, you've got the school administrators. So what you can see here is people sending messages person to person and specifically from group leader to their group. So if I press this button, or you can probably guess, there's, there's um, a circle there where the, the kitchen gar garden volunteer manager is sending a message to all grade uh, parents from grade three through to grade six, asking for those parents to, to volunteer. And if you look at the data visualisation on the, on the website, you'll see those parents responding. So this is what we think an engaged community looks like. So to, to the lessons that we've 
none of this is revolutionary, of course, but it's kind of interesting in a, in a digital context, in a platform context. So we've got five lessons that um, we thought we'd kind of share. Um, and the first is that, like in any group uh, larger than basically a basketball team, people tend to fall into roles. You t tend to find that um, there'll be a small group of folk who will be active, uh, sorry, ready, ready and, and able to, to be active members of the community and to really help drive what that community needs to do. There'll be a second group of, of people who will, while willing, aren't are constrained for one reason or another from actually undertaking um, what it is you're trying to achieve. And then there'll be the bulk of us, um, the, the, the followers who are reactive and a little bit more passive. And then, without exception in our experience, there will be one or two or maybe three folk in any community who will actively resist change. It's just the way it happens. And we call these guys the squeaky wheels. They come under various names. Um, and our objective is to help the leaders to basically draw the rest of the community into engagement. So that's what we try and do. So you can see this kind of organisational leverage. So we start with the leaders and try and help them. And you can see this organisational leverage happening at work here. And so this is a, me uh, a message being sent by a delegate at one of Australia's largest trade unions where he's actually sending a message to his helper group, asking them to then go and engage with at least three other folk to, to get them to come along and vote at a meeting. And what, what this means is that, um, notwithstanding the fact that organisers and delegates only make up 3% of the total population, they're actually engaging face-to-face 30% -face of the population. And that, you know, 30% is well in excess of, you know, commonly accepted tipping point for a network effect in the community of like 15, 20%. So it's a, a really effective way of um, engaging. Okay, so our second message is that we need to help those leaders. You know, these are volunteer leaders. I mean, they could be... So they're volunteer leaders. This is not their professional job. We need to help them understand that um, they need to be strategic about their messaging, that... Um, the, it's, and that, that's more than simply knowing which day of the week and the right time it is to send your message that, so that people see it. It's, it means more than telling you know, them knowing not to send too many messages. What it really means is them understanding um, when's the best time to send the message given their context. So they need to understand um, if I'm trying to achieve something, when are people most likely to find it relevant and um, to action it. And so you can see this in this um, uh, example. And so this is from that same wage bargaining cam campaign that we just looked at So for one trade union site. And this is across the campaign, so a six-month campaign. They sent 100 messages, basically. And the interesting thing is that, like, um, not only did the frequency of messages change across the, the, uh, the campaign, but also the type of messages changed. So at the start, it was about um, connecting with members and making sure that, that uh, we were able, you know, that they were able to actually... Uh, communicate with all their, co their member base. Um, then as the campaign kicked off, it became about making sure that, you know, recruiting members and making sure that the members, sorry, recruiting helpers and making sure that the members uh, were attending and, act and getting active in the mass meetings. And the really interesting bit is that kick up in the end when, um, and that represents when the negotiations are in their final, most intense stage with, with management. And so what's happening here is that the, the delegates are... Uh, um, trying to keep members informed about what's going on. So, like, even if it's a five-minute break in a, in a long negotiation, they're hopping out of the meeting and sending a message to their, to, their, to their fellow workers. And the effect of this is that the workers felt tangibly part of the process. You could feel... They could feel the tension and pressure that the uh, delegates were under. And so this really played out in, in the approval process for the actual bargaining itself. So what happens is the delegates come out with, well, this is our proposal, and the risk is that those squeaky wheels will somehow try and um, derail the process or create some uncertainty. And because everyone had risen the, 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 ridden the ride with the, with the delegates, this, under this process, the, um, the, uh, the, the approval was resounding. Those squeaky wheels had been silenced, so to speak. So our third thing that, that, that we learnt is that, like, in order for... Um, it's more about so the psychology of messaging, so helping leaders understand that um, in order to ask things of your community, if you want to get particular actions done, if you can identify those things that are the biggest barriers or the mo biggest motivations to get people to do something, then addressing those biggest things first will actually uh, have the largest marginal impact on what people do and so whether people act. So this was, uh, uh, we prepared this for a bike share scheme in Melbourne 
um, that's now the most successful bike share scheme in uh, Australia by utilisation, and they identified that their two, two biggest issues were cost and awareness. And so we love this example. This is from a 35-year-old principal at a school, and he's just natively digital aware, basically, of how to engage members on a, on a platform. And so this is him asking for um, members to, uh, parents to join the Parents Association. The Parents Association helps manage the, manage the school. And it's typically a difficult process. People, the biggest barrier is that um, it's a big commitment. Once you actually join this Parents Association, you've got 12 months and it's, it's you know, hard work, basically. So what, um, what he, he did was send this message, and this is the first time they had used the, the, the platform, and by having a click a button, yes, that, that was a great result. He got 35 members, which the previous year he had 20. But what he re was really clever in doing was offering up this other option, which says, no, I don't have time to help as a parents association, but I'd love to help with events. And by doing so, he got 75 members of a standing army of volunteers to, 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 to sign up. So he effectively not only um, uh, recruited his leadership group, but his helper group at the same time. So our fourth lesson, this is pretty obvious, but um, it, it you know, helps to illustrate in our experience, is about the technology, that like, for people to use technology, it has to be abundantly easy. So, um, and this came up yesterday, that like in, in order, we realised pretty early on that not everyone was going to get the app. Um, so what our job was to enable the leaders to actually send messages and then those messages to be just delivered in a multi-channel format. And for us, we didn't have the option of uh, in including Facebook in, in, or Twitter in this because the communities that we are dealing with, trade unions or wage negotiation, schools with kids, uh, it's not appropriate for this type of communication to be occurring in those social forums. So we enable a, a leader to hop on, send the message, and it's delivered via email, it's delivered via SMS and via the app. And then it's easy, the objective is to make it easy for that uh, leader to kind of embed clickable actions. And so this is an example of that. This is um, the, you know, from an organic farming cooperative that uses the platform, and they had to undertake a special resolution, so that's heading towards the governance kind of issues. And so anyone who's undertaken a special resolution, it requires 66% of members, and it's just bloody hard work to get these things up and going. Um, and so what you can see here is the message being delivered in three ways, through, via the app, through the email, with the buttons that can be clicked, and then through SMS. And given SMS um, has limited ability, you know, functionality, or the best we can do is embed a, a link, which will take that person to a web page where they can click, click the buttons. And you can see there that that person on the right there is, we haven't received your vote, so get off your butt and vote. Um, and uh, Ori Co-op got that resolution up, which is good. All right, so the, the fifth lesson, which is where we're up to now, is that it requires, to, to, to build an engaged community requires more than simply motivation, so skin in the game, it requires more than things to be easy, those, those requests to be easy. It also requires, if you want to build it over time, a, an ability to, for people to monitor the progress, to see progress, the, 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 the changing nature of the community. And so they need a scoreboard. And so, as I say, we're um, looking at this in, in, the, in the context of GetUp going, right, so we've got all this data about what communities are doing, um, so like volunteer activity, um, and we're trying to work out how to provide that back, that, that information back as a, as a form of them, the community's monitoring progress. Um, we can see that as data and automation become more and more important um, and more prevalent, that this is going to become key for, for platform co-ops everywhere. So we love this example. This is from Care and Share Associates. Um, it's a UK-based uh, uh, co worker cooperative. And this is their member scoreboard, uh, so dashboard. So they can kind of see on a weekly basis how things are progressing and then the, the, you know, how, how things are measuring uh, versus their key metrics. And that is it. Those are my five lessons. So I thank you. <laughs>